Well, as I mentioned uh, in my prayer, as I mentioned uh, beforehand, this is a rather large topic, and so it's, it is somewhat topical, which means we're going to be looking at more than just one passage. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you'd like to follow along in the, at least the initial reading, is to turn to Revelation 22, and I'd like to read verses 18 and 19. This is going to be the concluding argument to why we believe the scriptures are complete, and I'm going to deal with that one last, but since it is perhaps the most sobering of all the reasons, it would be a good place to start. Perhaps we'll pay attention to the other reasons more carefully having read this. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. John, through the inspiration of the Spirit, writes this, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. Now, obviously... Uh, what John says here has reference to the book of Revelation, but what he is expressing here is not something which, is, uh, which applies only to the book of Revelation. This is something which we're going to see is actually included throughout Scripture, where the Lord says, do not add to my words, do not take away from my words. The consequences for doing so are quite severe. So this should first of all warn us as far as adding to the word of God, and certainly from taking away from it either. We need to be careful that we do uh, neither. But we'll get back to that in the closing uh, argument. Now, as you know, I've already mentioned, we're looking at those areas in which we differ with other believers. And um, we did already break ground on perhaps uh, the, the topic of Scripture. Last Sunday morning as we were considering that the Bible is the Word of God, so I thought perhaps it would be a good place to begin. Uh, we looked at eight arguments, and I'm just going to repeat them briefly to reinforce in your minds and in your hearts, first of all, the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. We saw eight reasons. First of all, because the Bible says it's the Word of God, and that would only be a valid argument if the Bible is, in fact, the Word of God, which it is. And so if the Word of God says it's the Word of God, we should listen to it. So that was the first argument. Secondly, fulfilled prophecy. Only the God who directs the future can tell us what's going to happen in the future. And we saw many of examples of exactly how the Lord does that in the Word of God. Amazing fulfillments of prophecy which shows it to be God's word. The fact that the authors agree perfectly when you can't really f hardly find and perhaps you can't find any two people in the whole world that agree on, on everything or even some things. You have nearly 40 authors or perhaps 40 plus authors or some question as exactly how many authors there are in scripture who from all different walks of life writing over a period of 1500 years on those subjects which are most controversial, things having to do with religion, they all agree perfectly. And again, that shows the divine mind superintending the word of God. The fact that the Bible doesn't contain absurdities like the, uh, the earth riding on the back of elephants or the fact that the earth is flat and so forth. Uh, a book written, you know, quite well, completed 2,000 years ago and yet perfectly consistent with what we know about the world today. The fact that God verified it through miracles going to see something about that this evening as well. The reason why miracles were done in Scripture and why those who were proclaiming the Word of God did them was so that God could prove that these messengers were actually from Him and that this is His Word because only God can do things that, that are outside what we call the general normal laws of nature. So God would allow His spokesmen to do miracles in order to prove that He was speaking so that they would listen. The fact that the Bible alone has the ability to transform the life into that which is holy and righteous and good it is the only book that can do that because it is the only book that contains the gospel. 
It's the only religious book that claims to be the Word of God that actually reveals the God that we see in general revelation or natural revelation. The other books, and there are relatively few, that claim to be God's Word do not reveal a God like that. And, of course, the uh, irrefutable evidence, if you are a Christian, this is the only way it comes to you, is that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that this is His Word. He shows us and removes all doubt, at least as much as we can, as much as humanly speaking can be done. Our sin will always introduce some measure of doubt, but the Spirit of God is testifying and bearing witness, and He only does that to this Word, because this alone is the Word of God. Now tonight, what we want to look at is why we believe that this, this book, which is a collection of 66 books, contains everything that God intends to give to us. We know that there are churches that believe in continuing revelation. And we certainly believe that God gave special revelation. At least he did until the Bible was complete. But once the Bible was complete, the Lord no longer speaks in this same way. Now, I don't have eight reasons for you tonight why we believe this, but I certainly have uh, a number of them, seven. And uh, we'll work our way through these, hopefully in a logical order. Now, I want you to note at the outset that there's really two things we're going to be looking at tonight. We're going to be looking at the fact that the Bible is complete. But we're also going to look at the fact that the gifts, the charismatic gifts, the revelatory gifts, are no longer in operation because the Bible is complete. These two topics go hand in hand. Uh, if the Bible weren't complete, then God would still be giving revelation. He would do so in a supernatural way. But when the Bible is complete, those gifts that were given to communicate His Word and to confirm His Word are, are now, their, their purposes is, is, is complete. So they're no longer in operation. So we're going to look at the fact the Bible is complete and the gifts have ceased because of these seven reasons. The purpose of the gifts the indications in Scripture that the gifts would cease at some point in time. Indications in Scripture that the gifts were already waning as the Scripture was coming to its completion. Uh, an historical argument that the gifts did in fact cease. The fact that the Old Testament would be enough by itself, but also that the pattern of Revelation shows us why we have the New Testament. And then lastly, we're going to be looking at the canonical curse, which is where we started in our reading. So first of all, let's consider that the Bible is complete because, and that the gifts have ceased because of the purpose of the gifts. Now, I do want you to understand, I think most of you do, that most of you know my background, that I actually was a part of a, um, a full gospel church, what we call a Pentecostal church, and I was a part of a charismatic church uh, for, for several years. So I'm very familiar with what goes on in those churches. As a matter of fact, I was an assistant pastor at a charismatic church. And I do know that the belief in those churches are typically that the gifts are the norm. And that everybody should be able to exercise at least one of these charismatic gifts. But I do want you to see that God had a purpose for giving these gifts, and the purpose was not so that we would all have a gift exercise, but it was rather that he might reveal his word and establish his church. Now, really, as you look through the, the history of the Bible that's revealed here, there was never really a time when every believer had these gifts. Now, every believer has a gift. We would call them service gifts, but there was never a time when every believer had a charismatic gift, these special revelatory gifts that, we, again, we call charismatic gifts. These things were never the norm, and certainly when revelation ceased, they ceased. I mean, think about the Old Testament, for instance. Did everybody in the Old Testament exercise a spiritual gift? No, actually, they were very rare. You know, the prophets prophesied, and sometimes the prophets did miracles. Sometimes there were kings that prophesied, sometimes statesmen like Daniel, sometimes a priest. But it was never everyone. 
that was not the norm. It was relatively few. The same thing is actually true in the New Testament. As much as some might like to believe that everyone had gifts, not everyone possessed these gifts. Again, we might say that there were relatively few. Uh, the pastor of the uh, charismatic church that I was the assistant pastor at continued <clears throat> to believe and to teach that, that everyone should be able to speak in tongues. You know, if there's any one gift that, that everyone can exercise, that would be the one. And yet, the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 29 through 30, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak in tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? Well, the implied answer to each of those questions is no. They do not, not everyone has these particular gifts. God would give gifts to whom he willed and when he willed for specific purposes. It was actually far more important to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in a saving way, which was evidenced by love, than any of these particular gifts. Jonathan Edwards had an interesting sermon on this point where he points out that even unbelievers possessed these gifts. I mean, for instance, uh, Saul was among the prophets, and uh, King Saul, and he was uh, not a converted man. Uh, Judas, I think there's no question about Judas, he was actually sent out with the 12 in order to cast out demons, in order to heal, and even to raise the dead. Judas was an unconverted person. Edwards points out that though it may be a great privilege to have these gifts, there is something that is still far more important, far more valuable. And it's really what ultimately God gave these gifts in order to establish. And that is his gospel and life through his gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit through his gospel in our hearts so that we might love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. This is what Paul is contrasting. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, he gives a list of all the charismatic gifts. But then he ends the chapter by saying, I show you a still more excellent way. And then he launches off into 1 Corinthians 13, which is the chapter on love. Listen to what he says here. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. I do want you to notice here that uh, it's impossible for a true believer not to have love. And yet Paul is contemplating situations here where a person may exercise gifts, charismatic gifts, and yet not have love, it profits them nothing at all. He goes on to say that um, when, when it all boils down to, what, you know, when everything is said and done, what is most important is that we love, that we have this love, because love is what is going to endure when all the gifts have ceased. So again, the reason why the Lord gave the gifts was to establish uh, this. The gifts were never actually given for everyone to exercise, but the gifts were given for a specific purpose, and that was to communicate special revelation and to confirm that that revelation was, in fact, God's word. I mean, prophets declared God's will. They foretold what was going to happen in the future. They wrote inspired history of God's dealing with his people. In the New Testament, Jesus and his apostles laid the foundation of the church through the gospels and through the letters, and the Lord allowed them to perform miracles to confirm that the message came from him. Now, we know that there were other gifts before scripture was completed that the Lord used to guide the church. But once the scriptures were complete, the church was to rely on this foundation upon which the church would be built. It's interesting that there was another purpose that was given 
for those particular uh, charismatic gifts, and that was as a sign to unbelieving Israel to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. Paul points that out in 1 Corinthians 14 when he's talking about uh, tongues. He says this, In the law it is written, By men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why on the day of Pentecost did the Lord uh, cause all the, you know, all the, the apostles and, and the, those who um, were believers, who were relatively few, gathered in the upper room for prayer? Why did the Lord allow them to speak in all those different languages? Why is it when that happened, all these people gathered and they heard them speaking the wonderful works of God in their own language? What was the purpose of all of that? It was that it might be a sign to them that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. That was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. By, the men, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so, they will not listen to me. You know, it's interesting, too, that um, the Jews were given, of course, the first opportunity to hear the gospel because it was the fulfillment of uh, everything that God had promised to them, from the seed of the woman through the uh, seed of Abraham and uh, the son of David. Uh, God had made all of his promises to Israel. He made his covenants with Israel, and because of that, they had the opportunity to hear the gospel first. And then once they rejected it, the Lord brought judgment. First of all, he gathered his people out of Israel. There were Jews that received Jesus Christ. But after the majority of them rejected and the leaders rejected, God brought judgment. But it's, it's not surprising, I think, that judgment fell on Israel just after the New Testament canon closed. The last books of Hebrews and the book of Revelation were written just prior to 70 AD so that, again, this purpose of the gifts being wrapped up as a sign to Israel once God had gotten the word out to all of Israel, and that's the reason for the missionary journeys and the reason why the gospel went to the Jews first and then when they rejected it, turned to the Gentiles, was so that the gospel would reach all of Israel first before the cessation of those signs that were meant for Israel because Israel's opportunity closed once 70 AD came as far as, as a nation. Uh, God had gathered all those people together. Now, it's not saying there isn't any hope for Jews. They can be saved. They can be converted. But it's going to be by trusting in Jesus Christ and coming into the church. It's not by some other plan that God has for them in the future. But the thing is, God reached out to Israel first. God brought signs and wonders. He brought miracles. He brought tongues and so forth as a sign and a witness to them. They would not listen. And when God... Uh, as it were, closed that chapter on Israel's life and history. At that same time, the gifts ceased. The New Testament scriptures were complete. So again, we need to understand what the purpose of the gifts were. It was to communicate the word of God, to confirm the word of God, and particularly to confirm it to Israel. And once that was done, and the New Testament scripture, or the New Testament, the whole Bible was complete, and God's plan for Israel was complete, the purpose of the gifts was fulfilled, and they were done. They passed away. Now, that, was, that took a little time to develop. The next arguments aren't going to take quite so long. Second argument, there are indications in the scriptures that the gifts themselves would cease because their purposes would be fulfilled. In 1 Corinthians 13, I've already made reference to that, the, the love chapter. This is what we read in verses 8 through 12. Love never fails. It's never going to cease. That is something that no matter what happens in the history of God's dealings, that is the one thing that will never stop because that is what God is all about and that's what he's put in our hearts and that's what we're going to enjoy with him forever. But love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, and he's talking here about the gift of knowledge, not just knowledge in general, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, 
the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. Now Paul here is obviously talking about a time when the gifts would cease. And nobody questions the fact that, that certainly at some point in history, they were going to cease because that's what Paul says. The only question is when is this going to happen? Well, one possibility is at the consummation. When the Lord comes again and after the final judgment, when everything is made perfect, certainly there's not going to be any need then for the imperfect knowledge that would come through any means. Certainly by that time, the gifts will have ceased because the perfect has come. But historically, the church has understood this a bit differently, believing that there's sort of like a twofold perfection of the church, a point in which the church moves from its infancy to maturity and then moves from maturity to consummation, perfection, glorification, you know, the final stage. They believe that what Paul was speaking here, uh, was speaking about here was not just the consummation, not just the end, but also that point in time when the perfect foundation of the church will have been laid by the teaching of Jesus Christ and his apostles. You know, the Bible speaks in more than one place of the fact that the church is built upon a foundation. That foundation is Jesus Christ and his apostles. Now, we understand when it talks about Jesus being a part of the foundation, I mean, it's his work that, that lays the foundation of the church. He is the cornerstone. He's the most important part. But what about the apostles? How do they figure into the foundation? Did they die on the cross for our sins? Did, did they do what Jesus did? No. So how are they a part of the foundation? Well, I think it has to do with their teaching and their preaching, which lays the foundation for the church upon which the church is being built. Let me, I should read you that passage. Paul speaks of it, um, let's see. Um, hmm. Doesn't look like I included the book. Well, let me just read it. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. And are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, basically, the point is this, that Jesus, through his teaching and preaching, as well as through his work, and the apostles, through their continual, uh, well, the continuing teaching and preaching, given by our Lord Jesus Christ in the completion of the Scriptures, laid the foundation. And once the foundation was laid, and the perfect had come, or the perfect expression of God's revelation, the complete word of God, then revelation ceased, and so did the gifts. So again, the idea being that these gifts are going to cease. When are they going to cease? When the perfect comes, what is the perfect? The church historically has believed on account of, of really what the church is built upon, that it's the perfect expression of God's will, of his revelation. And of course, once that was complete, the gifts, the revelatory gifts were no longer necessary. Now, thirdly, as Revelation is drawing to a close this special revelation, this verbal revelation of God, we see something interesting in Scripture included in one of the last books written. The two last books written were Hebrews and Revelation. Hebrews, throughout its entirety, is trying to prove to the Jewish believers the superiority of Jesus Christ over the Old Testament system. He's superior to the Old Testament mediators. He's superior to the angels. He's, he's made a superior sacrifice. He's a greater priest. He's better in every single way. And the reason why he is arguing so strenuously with them is because that system that they're tempted to go back to because of the persecution of Rome, because the Jews were not persecuted by Rome. They were a, a, a religion that was lawful. But Christians were becoming... Uh, it was becoming obvious that Christians were not Jews and they were beginning to persecute the Christians. And so these Jewish Christians were being tempted to go back to 
uh, the Judaistic system, the author to the Hebrews is arguing two things. First of all, Christ is superior in every way. But secondly, this Old Testament system is about to be destroyed. It's about to vanish away. And when it vanished was 70 AD, when the Romans came and surrounded the city and destroyed the temple and everything else. And, and the author to the Hebrews says, if you stay connected with that system, you are going to perish with that system. So the book of Hebrews was written very close to 70 AD. Well, this is what the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 2, verses 2 through 4, again showing us that these signs and wonders, these revelatory gifts that we think were the norm for the church were actually, at this point, not the norm any longer. And the author to the Hebrews actually distances himself, as it were, from the actual doing of these things. It says here in Hebrews 2, verses 2 through 4, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. I want you to notice here that it, it repeats what we've seen. Uh, the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ and the apostles. This gospel, the author to the Hebrews, is, is urging upon his readers, was first spoken through the Lord then confirmed by those who heard. These would be the apostles. God was testifying with them, you know, testifying that this is in fact his word by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Notice the author to the Hebrews says that's not how he's testifying to us, but that is how he confirmed his word through them. Now, again, if this were the norm, we'd say, well, why isn't the author of the Hebrews pointing to the fact that this is being testified and confirmed by all the stuff going on in, in the congregation that he's a part of? Well, it's not because it wasn't the norm. And even at this point, he's, he's pointing to this and re referring to it in the past tense. God, it, was, it was confirmed, you see, to us. Not that it's continually being confirmed and not that these things are going on right now to confirm it. God confirmed it back then through them in these ways. And so it's confirmed. So he was testifying through them and he did not need to continue to testify or to confirm that it was his word. We see a sign here in, the, in one of the last books of the New Testament that these things, there was already a distance, as it were, between, um, well, between these things when they were operating and now they're not operating, as it were, or at least uh, not to the degree that we might think that they were, at least be led to believe by churches that believe these things are continuing. Now, the fourth argument is that historically the gifts actually did cease. Uh, the early church writers recognized that the scriptures were complete. They recognized that what they were writing was not the same thing as what the apostles wrote. It didn't have that authority. They treated the apostles and their writings as scripture, on a par with the rest of scripture. But they did not look at their own writings in the same way. They also recognized that the gifts ceased with the apostles. Now, by the way, there were, of course, through history, people who claimed to have these gifts and people who sought to exercise these gifts, but history has proven that those who tried to do it were schismatics and heretics. They were preaching a false gospel. They were trying to, uh, again, get followers and so forth. They may have been sincere, but they were wrong. They were not giving God's word, and they were not exercising these gifts. Now, we should recognize, and, and here's, here's where the difference comes today, that again, I told you I was in a Pentecostal church, you know they exist. Charismatic churches exist. If, if this is true and the gifts actually ceased, why do they believe that they continue today? Well, because they believe that the gifts were given again. They believe that, that God has revived those gifts and renewed those gifts because they believe that we are living in the last days. They believe in a, you know, a Zusa Street uh, revival, early 1900s, where the gift of tongues began again. Uh, 
and this is what began the modern day charismatic movement. Now, as I've said, and I was in these churches for a long time, I know where they're, what they're looking at in scripture to try to, to prove this, and, and this is it. You might turn this one up. Acts chapter two, verses 15 through 18. This is the passage they use to prove that these gifts, we should expect to see them come back, and we should you know, expect the church will be exercising these gifts because we are living in the last days. Okay, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. And let's note the context here. This is after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, when, when they're speaking in tongues, Peter gets up to explain what's going on. He begins in verse 15. Um, For these men are not drunk, as you suppose. They, they thought that you know, because of the strange things they were doing, they might have had too much wine. They, they haven't been drinking. For it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Well, there you go. Revival of the gifts in the last days. We're in the last days. Therefore, the gifts are in operation again. Now, what's wrong with that interpretation? I told you, I don't know how many times I heard this passage appealed to for this very thing. But let's, uh, let's take a look at this for a minute. Why is it that Peter is quoting the prophet Joel? And that is who he's, he's quoting here, the Old Testament prophet. It's because he wants to show what was going on at that time and why it was going on at that time. Notice, he says, this, which is what you see in here now, this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Well, what is this that he's referring to? It's what was going on then, on the day of Pentecost. Not what's going on now, 2,000 years later, but what was going on in those days? Why is it that they were speaking in tongues? This is what the prophet Joel said was going to happen in the last days. You know, all these gifts were going to be displayed. Okay, I think it, it seems fairly obvious. Now again, the reason why the confusion is because of the last days, the phrase the last days. We often refer to the last days as being today. Some extended all the way back to then. But we do need to realize that these are really not the last days that he was referring to then. Those were the last days that were being referred to then because the prophecy of Joel was being fulfilled. And it showed that those were the last days. The last days of what? The last days of the world? Well, of course not. But the last days of God's dealing with Israel before he takes the kingdom from them and gives them to that new nation that would produce its fruits. The last days before God's judgment falls upon Israel for all the sins that they've committed against God. And especially the last sin of having crucified their Messiah. The last days before the judgment of God fell on them. By the way, the, the epistles of John, the letters of John, were also written very close to the closing of the, of the New Testament scriptures. And John writes in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, these things. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know it is the last hour. Now again, Peter says that on the day of Pentecost that what was happening there signaled the fact that they were in the last days. By the time you get to John, which is closer to 70 AD, He's saying, we're in the last hour. Are we living in the last days now? No, they were living in the last days then. John wrote, and it was the last hour. So should we expect that prophecy of Joel to be referring to the present time? No, it was referring to then when the gifts were in operation. But as we've already seen, they were prophesied that it would end. We saw them waning, and historically they've ceased. So that resurgence of gifts or those giving of gifts in the last days was fulfilled and it ended back then. 
The last hour has already passed. God has already brought judgment upon Israel as he said that he would. So again, the point being that the gifts have ceased and we do not believe they're in operation today because we're living in the last days, because we're not living in the last days. They were living in the last days, even in the last hour. And that had to do with judgment upon Israel. Now again, that's an area where we differ with other churches. But that's what we believe the scripture is saying. I think it's quite clear. I don't see how you could see it any other way, and yet we do, okay? People do. All right, well, getting back to the completion of the, old te of, of the scriptures, uh, this would be reason number five. The Old Testament by itself would actually be enough. Again, the passage I read, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, we do believe that at the time Paul wrote this that there wasn't much of the New Testament written yet and that Paul was referring primarily to the Old Testament scriptures and he's telling us that if that's all we had, that would be enough. By the way, most churches today, evangelical churches what we call dispensational churches, what do they typically do with the Old Testament? Now, they don't want to say they do this, but in essence, the Old Testament's for Israel and the New Testament is for us, or at least parts of the New Testament are. So functionally, the Old Testament gets separated and set aside. Paul here is talking about the Old Testament when he tells us that this is all we need. It's not something that's been done away with. It's something that is actually complete enough to train us that we would be adequate and equipped for everything that the Lord has for us. So the Old Testament would be enough. Well, then why do we need the New Testament? Well, that brings us to the next reason. Because of the way God gives revelation. Uh, God's pattern, uh, the way that he deals with us throughout history, uh, explains why we have the New Testament and explains also why we don't need anything more than the New Testament, and we're not going to get anything more than the New Testament until the second coming. God's pattern throughout history has been to do this, to reveal what's going to happen, to record it when it does happen, to explain what happens, and then to reveal what's going to happen next, and then to stop revealing. This is the pattern of Scripture. Let me give it to you, uh, just explain it to you in terms of what he's given us in the Bible. Uh, after the fall of man, God promised that he would send a redeemer. And, of course, he revealed that, who that Savior would be throughout the whole Old Testament. Through his promises, through his prophecies, through his types and shadows, they were all pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then once all of that was complete, there was silence. Uh, do you know how long it is between the, the closing of what we call the Old Testament canon or the scriptures to the next revelation that God gave. Again, I, I think that you know, the churches that believe in the continuance of the gifts don't seem to realize that there was 400 years in which there was no prophecy, there were no gifts, there was no revelation from God. It, it ended with Malachi and the silence was broken when the angel, well, when Gabriel went to Zacharias and told him that his wife Elizabeth was going to bear a son. That was the first revelation God gave in 400 years. So when God completes his revelation, there is silence because he's given all that he has to give and there's no reason to give anything more. He's, he's explained what he's going to do. I mean, look at there's over, I think, something like three or 400 prophecies regarding Jesus Christ. The theme of Scripture, all of Scripture is the gospel. And so all of this is given leading up to it. And then when God has finished telling us what he's going to do, there's silence. And then the next thing we see is the silence is broken by the fulfillment of those prophecies. We see it in the, in the revelation of the forerunner of the Messiah. That's what Gabriel was talking to Zacharias about. And then Gabriel goes to Mary to tell her that she's going to uh, give birth to a son supernaturally and he's going to be the Messiah. We see the fulfillment of all these prophecies in the Gospels that record the life and teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it records, God, God's told them what's going to happen, and then he records what actually did happen. 
Uh, he also records, of course, the fact that the promises were all fulfilled and they were extended to Israel and Israel rejected them and so they turned to the, to the Gentiles. And then in the letters that are being written throughout the rest of the New Testament, they're all explaining what Messiah's work was all about and that's the way that God operates after the, the prophecy is fulfilled. It's, it's recorded and then there's all this revelation to explain what it all means. That's what all the New Testament letters are about, to explain to us the work of Jesus Christ and, and what difference it makes and how he fulfilled all those prophecies. And then they did one more thing. They tell us what's going to happen next. What's the next thing that we're to expect on the horizon? And the scriptures have basically told us two things, that the, the kingdom of heaven is going to advance until it fills the whole earth, and eventually Jesus Christ is going to come again. Now, following that pattern, after the Lord has, has finished telling us what's going to happen in the future, then there is silence again. A silence that will not be broken until Jesus Christ comes again. The whole Old Testament pointed to his first coming, and then it fell silent for 400 years. Jesus Christ comes, it's recorded, it's explained, and then we're told about his second coming. And then silence falls again until our Lord Jesus Christ returns and then the silence <clears throat> will be broken. So again, we have a complete revelation. We have what God intends for us to have in Scripture <clears throat> according to the pattern that he has given to us, the way he deals with man, the way he reveals, and so forth. But then we come to the final reason, and that's where we began with the Scripture reading. And this is the most sobering part of the whole thing, and that is the canonical curse, what we call now, why do we believe that the Bible is complete and that nothing should be added to it by way of revelatory gifts? Well, because of the reasons we've just seen, the purpose of the gifts and so forth, but also because of the canonical curse. Now, the canonical curse is God's warning not to add or to take away from his word. By the way, whenever somebody gets up and says, thus saith the Lord, and they are adding to his word, regardless of what they may think. That is, in fact, what they're doing. Now, the last verses of the last book written in the New Testament are a warning not to alter, not to add to or subtract from anything that was written. Let me read it to you again, Revelation 22, 18 through 19. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. Now, I told you before, technically, this refers to the book of Revelation. But the reason why it's there is because this is the way that God has, has warned throughout the scriptures not to add or take away from anything, he says, so we shouldn't be surprised to find it in the book of Revelation, but the fact that it's there and it closes uh, the, the New Testament, as it were, is, I think, something we should expect to see. Because the Lord continually warned his people of this very thing. When God gave his commandments through Moses, he warned them, do not change my commandments. Deuteronomy 4.2. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Uh, the, um, the author of Proverbs 30, which I believe is Agur, says this in Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, with regard to every word of the Lord. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. And then Jesus applies it to the uh, Pharisees in Matthew 15, 6 through 9, when he says you're altering the word of God by your traditions. You are changing what God says. He says, um, by this you invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Again, they were adding their traditions, they were adding their interpretations to the word of God, and because of that, Jesus calls them hypocrites. By the way, 
tampering with the word of God was severely dealt with. And as you can see from the canonical curse at the end of the book of Revelation, I mean, who wants the, the plagues written in this book to be added to you? Who wants to have your name or your, your, your right to the tree of life taken away? If a false prophet prophesied in the name of the Lord and what he said wasn't true, if it didn't come to pass, that prophet fell under the curse and actually was sentenced to death. We read in Deuteronomy 18, verses 18 through 20. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require of him. But now listen. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. This is what the Lord thought about prophets speaking in his name and saying, thus saith the Lord, when God, as a matter of fact, had not commanded that. Now, we should ask this question, perhaps another, another topic for another evening. Does God not care anymore about whether his word is altered? Sometimes we think in the Old Testament, when God was kind of severe, but in the New Testament, it doesn't really matter. No, God is a God who never changes. Now, he does show grace and he shows mercy, and it seems like he shows more of that in his dealings with men today. But we do need to recognize that this is what that deserves. If you seek, think about this, if you seek to exercise a, a gift, a revelatory gift, which is no longer in existence, which has actually ceased, then you are presumptuously adding to God's word when you say, thus saith the Lord. And by the way, when I was in those charismatic and Pentecostal churches, I heard that a lot. Uh, one time, again, just as a personal example, we were attending a worship service at a charismatic church years ago in, in uh, uh, Wisconsin. And the, the, they had a, you know, like the full electric band up there and so forth. It was the best we could find at the time. And uh, so anyway, the bass player starts shaking and quivering and then speaking in broken English, thus saith the Lord, and he lets out this message. And I remember turning to Donna and saying, if God has not said that, if these are not God's words, that person deserves to die for that. That is a crime that God says deserves death. Now, we have to admit, if this person is a true believer, God's not going to necessarily exact that judgment on him. The, the person may sincerely believe it. What he's doing is wrong. It's serious. But again, Christians sin, and God doesn't strike us down for those sins because our sins are covered by, by Christ and his mercy and grace. It doesn't give us an excuse to sin, but that's the reason why we don't see them dropping like flies everywhere when somebody says, thus saith the Lord, you know, this kind of thing going on. But we do need to realize that God still takes it seriously. And that is what it deserves. The canonical curse. If you add to my words or take away from my words, this is what you're going to get. God does not want us tampering with his word. And that's why I think the early writers after the apostolic age, they looked at what the apostles wrote and they said, that's what God said, that's scripture. But what I wrote is in scripture. It's just an interpretation of scripture. You know, it's not... It's not with, you know, necessarily uh, the word of the Lord, so you have to take it you know, at that face value. So to summarize what we've seen, God gave the charismatic gifts to communicate and confirm his word and to be a witness to Israel, but now that his word is complete, the gifts have ceased. And their cessation, as I mentioned, their, their ceasing was predicted in Scripture. It's actually seen in Scripture. Historically, the church recognized that the gifts ceased. And so we should not expect to see them start up again. We've already seen that that prophecy in Joel does not have to do with these days. It had to do with those days when God was actually completing his word. But now that his word is complete, we shouldn't expect to see anything more. The next thing that we should actually look for is the fulfillment of his prophecies regarding the kingdom of God. It's going to expand throughout the whole earth and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which I don't believe personally any of us here are going to live to see because I think it's still a long ways in the future. The kingdom of heaven has a long ways to go before it fills the earth to the degree that the Lord says it's going to. But in the meantime, we have a complete rule of faith and practice. 
that we shouldn't add to or take away from under the threat of curse. Now, in closing, let me just make three quick applications and uh, talk about what difference does it make. Okay, what difference does it make? Well, you've already seen a big one. The canonical curse, that's a big difference. But first of all, if the gifts have ceased, the first application is don't seek the gifts. You know, when I was in charismatic churches and Pentecostal churches, that's all we did was seek after the gifts. Seek that you can prophesy. Seek that you can speak in tongues. Seek that you can interpret. And we were busily pursuing all those things, but we were missing what we really should be doing, which is advancing the kingdom of heaven. So, so many Christians today believe that that's what Christianity is all about. And so they're going to be led astray if they seek God in this way. Now, instead, rather than seeking the gifts, what we should seek is what Paul said was much more important than the gifts. That which is going to continue after the gifts have ceased, and that is the fullness of the Spirit of God to love God and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That is the most important, the most precious. That is the evidence that we're actually born again. The reason why God gave the gifts to give us the scriptures was to give us the means by which we might gain this love, that we might be transformed, that we might be saved by the gospel of Christ. So don't look for the gifts that, that give the means to that end. You know, the, the, the gifts have been given. We have the means. Let's... Use the means to become more like Jesus. That's ultimately why it was given in the first place. That's what we should be pursuing, is Christ's likeness, not the gifts. Secondly, and this isn't something I hope we would fall into, either the first one or the second one, don't seek God's will from someone who claims to have prophetic gifts. <coughs> How many people have been led astray by prophets? You know, they, they, they stand up and they say, Thus saith the Lord, God speaking through me, you should listen. And, and people do listen. I was a part of that church, and I know the people who were in that church. And, and the, the pastor could say no wrong. He could do no wrong. God was speaking through him. He must be somebody special. We need to listen to him and don't dare speak against him. Because if you do, you're sinning against God. You're, you're reaching out your hands that were against the Lord's anointed something David said he would never do with regard to Saul. Don't do that. You'll get into trouble. So these people chase these prophets. They hang on every word that they have to say. But again, realize that if what these prophets are saying does not agree with the word of God, they are false prophets. And they are likely under God's curse. And I think many of them, um, and I'm not going to name names or anything like that. I think you know who's out there, but many of them, when they get up and they're, and they're trying to lead people in a particular direction, they are not leading them the direction that God would have them to go. They are leading them astray. And for that reason, God's going to deal severely with him, or with them. But this also applies to what they might try to teach or preach. If it doesn't agree with the Bible, it should not be listened to regardless of what they have to say. And then finally, we're not to listen to them, but God has given us something to listen to. He has given us his word. Uh, John Calvin uh, brought things into perspective when he said, you know, if God were to come into this room and open his mouth and speak to you directly, he said that word from God would have no more authority than the word he's already given to us. And that is the way we need to respect what the word of God has said. I mean, we don't have the right to tear pages out of it, to accept some of it and reject others. We do realize that some of it is fulfilled in the Old Testament, in Christ, and some of it has, has been done away with, like a ceremonial system and so forth. But there's a great deal in the Old Testament, as Paul reminds us, that still applies, that is enough to equip us to, to do everything that God would have us to do. And we have the New Testament as well. We don't pick and choose what we are going to believe and what we're not going to believe. All we can do is listen to God speak and submit to it, believe what he tells us. Embrace his promises, believe his, his prophecies, uh, obey his commandments, uh, and of course believe everything else that he says in scripture. We are not given the option, we are not over the scriptures. We don't have authority over this, we are under the scriptures. This is God's word, we need to listen to it. It is the touchstone of truth. <clears throat> 
the only safe way to live is to live by what the Word of God says, particularly the Gospel. Our Lord tells us if you would be saved, you have to trust Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, turn from your sins, and do what He calls you to do. We have to listen to that because that is what God tells us is the only way to salvation. Jesus says that He is the door, the only door, the only way to God. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. And so the fact that this is God's Word means that we must build our lives on it. You know, the church is being built on the foundation of Christ and the apostles. We're a part of the church. We need to found our lives on that. We, are, we need to stake our lives on it. This is God's Word, and it is true. In closing, let me just simply reiterate that by what Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Again, something which is true, not just of what he says in the sermon, but in everything he reveals to us in the Old Testament, that still applies to us, of course, in the New Testament, and through the writers of the letters and so forth, the entire Bible. This is what he says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, notice, can't just know it, can't just believe it. You've got to act on it. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. These are not optional things and again I want you to recognize Jesus isn't saying the one who hears and believes these things or the one who hears and doesn't believe these things. It, it appears as though both of them hear, both of them believe. One acts on it and the other doesn't. You have to act on the word of God. You have to believe what it says. You have to... Uh, uh, submit to the commandments. You have to embrace the promises. You need to tremble at the threatenings. You have to respond to the Word of God in the way that the Lord calls us to. It's not enough just to know it and believe it. We have to actually act upon it. We actually have to apply it. And ultimately, we do have to become like Jesus Christ. That is the evidence that we have acted on it in a saving way that we love his Father with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and, and go that direction and that we love our neighbor as ourself, even our enemies, as the parable of the Good Samaritan reminds us. So this is God's word. Build your life on this because this is what ultimately we are all going to be held accountable for. This is the word of life and there is none other. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us apply what we've heard as we need to hear it uh, individually.